Uh, hey folks, this is Drew. Uh, I'll take the community news and I'll be back uh, later in the session. Uh, now, uh, essentially everything that we have in the presentation today is community news of one form or another. But we have one other item that isn't covered by a major, uh, major subsection elsewhere in the presentation. And that is, that item is to remind everyone of Open Aperio 2018 taking place in Montreal, a city that I've never been to and am very excited to, to visit. Uh, so the dates are June 3rd through 7th. I'm not looking at a calendar, but I'm pretty sure that June 3rd is the Sunday. Uh, and that is, the Sunday is the day where we do uh, pre-conference workshops, one, uh, one set of them in the morning and one set in the afternoon. Uh, they're very informative and a great uh, bargain. As a matter of fact, some of them are free, some are paid, but even the, uh, even the paid ones are very inexpensive. Uh, the conference will be held at the Delta Marriott. I'm sure it's a lovely venue. Uh, and you should know that early bird registration ends on May 1st, so there is uh, still time, uh, but not a lot of it, uh, to take advantage of early bird uh, pricing. The, the full program and schedule uh, for the event is available now. Uh, it's, it's available at that URL. Uh, that URL is actually the main URL for the conference. There, there are many things uh, that you can learn there. Uh, not just the program. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, like we said before, please be aware of, U of the UPortal collaboration days. Uh, UPortal, uh, among Aperio projects, uh, UPortal uh, may take the, the conference uh, most seriously or, or perhaps tied for most seriously. Uh, we, UPortal always has good attendance, uh, a, a large amount of good content in the program. And in recent memory, we have had this habit of meeting either before or after uh, the main conference uh, activities, uh, before or after or sometimes both. You portal collaboration days are kind of a big deal. Uh, they're a little bit informal, uh, but not utterly informal. We normally uh, organize around a, a set of topics ahead of time, uh, loosely organized around a set of topics. That uh, hyperlink, the last one in, on this slide, is where we are gathering um, ideas this time for these collaboration days. Uh, please review the topics, please add to the topics, please indicate which topics that are already there you would also be interested in. Uh, please attend collaboration days. It's a great opportunity to have influence, to have a, a, a big voice in the community and the direction of the platform. Uh, we do a significant amount of planning for the next year uh, at the conference, and we're very, uh, very eager to hear what everyone thinks. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite, uh, I want to say Jonathan Tran, uh, I think is the one, uh, to cover this topic. And Jonathan, uh, I, I'll do my best uh, not to interrupt you. I'll try to keep that to a minimum. But I'm excited to uh, communicate about this topic as well. All righty. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Tim was originally supposed to talk about this, but it seems like he's still in another meeting. Um, my name is Jonathan Tran. I'm from Cal Poly Pomona. And we're basically looking at doing a, uh, a UI refresh of our current portal, My, uh, my CPP. So quickly, we have about 25, 26,000 students, um, almost 4,000 staff, and we uh, launched uh, MyCPP on uPortal back in 2014. And last but not least, we recently upgraded to uPortal 5 uh, last month. So these are the, the concepts 
or the goals of our uh, UI refresh. Um, like it says, modernize the look and feel, make it more visually attractive. Um, we're looking to also do other things, um, implement elements that are on that we're familiar with on other websites, such as Facebook, Netflix, so on and so forth. And also implement um, some behaviors with these the same elements, such that that are they behave in a in a way that we're used to. And then also, last but not least, uh, give a lot more um, content on the landing page, especially um, content for um, specific to that user, without having to go all over the place. So um, these next couple slides, we basically have what we're um, what we're looking to uh, implement soon. So in this um, in this mockup. We have a couple of elements going on. Um, so uh, there are um, quite a few. We have a couple carousel um, items going on. The top one being uh, a spotlight to highlight some important things that we want to uh, put in front of the user. And then the second set of the second carousel that you see below is information that is tailored to that user. So hopefully we would be able to show them their uh, their class schedules, um, stuff that they need to get done, and um, and so on and so forth. Um, another thing that we're looking to um, hopefully implement is the hamburger menu that we've seen on some uh, many apps, web apps and especially uh, smartphone apps. And then this would uh, take the place of the current nav that runs left to right on the on the portal. Similar to what uh, UC Riverside uh, has implemented, we're also looking to implement a waffle menu um, that would basically give students a quick launch to real to uh, commonly use services on campus such as uh, Blackboard, uh, Bronco Direct, which is our uh, SIS, email, and some other some other stuff. Um, on the next Slide. So, in from our goals, we talked about how we want uh, some of these elements to behave in a way that people are used to. And a lot of feedback that we've gotten in the past is that notifications, when you click on the notifications, it goes takes them to either the the tab or the the portlet for notifications, which is not what users expect nowadays. So um, with working with Unicon, we are getting closer and closer to uh, implementing the functionality such that when you click on the notification icon, it will drop down a list of notifications that the user has. And then on the next slide, like I mentioned in the beginning, we have a couple carousels. So we have another set of carousels at, at the bottom of this mockup for um, other content that we would like to um, bring front and center to uh, the users, to the students. So we have a couple recommended things, and then also at the very bottom, kind of cut off, you also um, see uh, favorites by which students will hopefully be able to just mark as certain things as favorites and be able to jump to them quickly. And uh, I believe that's everything that I got for that. Thanks, man. Uh, that was great. Uh, we're going to see a little more information on some of those uh, bits later in the slide presentation, sort of a more, uh, you know, kind of technical deep dive. Uh, but the, the next item we have in our agenda is the sustaining engineering update, which I believe uh, Mr. Benito is going to take this time. I am. Good morning, folks. How y'all doing? All right, so lots of great things have happened under Sustaining Engineering. Just a reminder, thank you all to uh, our subscribers. It really makes a difference to be able to have um, a, a large number of hours to really invest in uPortal portlets and related projects. Uh, we try to stretch those a, a long way and uh, get the most bang for everyone's buck. Um, so some of the highlights is uh, support for Docker images straight out of uPortal Start. Again, new portal start is the new uh, repo where you kind of configure uPortal 5 um, for your specific institution. 
Um, there's also API documentation based on Swagger, which is a neat tool. We'll see that in another slide here in just a moment. Um, lots of good stuff and notifications, including a Spring Boot refactor. This is going to be something we'll probably want to start basing future Portlet and Soffit projects off of. And several releases, lots of fixes, lots of things. So a total of almost 250 hours invested this past quarter um, under sustained engineering. Pretty exciting. So with Docker, uh, we now have three targets uh, right out of uPortal start. There is uh, uPortal, so you'd create a uPortal Docker image with Gradle W, uh, I forgot the command. Um, the one thing cool about these three targets is uPortal is the one that's just the web server. So if you're going to do multiple deployments or deploying the servers, it's the uPortal Docker image that gets copied out to your servers. Uh, when you need to use some of the tools, such as data init, um, you would use a uPortal CLI image. And that's where that functionality uh, will be kept. And then, of course, as you portal demo, most institutions will not want to run this. This is mostly getting that quick start version up. That's been moved over to the uh, public Docker Hub. So if you go and navigate to um, the Docker Hub and search for either a Perio or a uPortal, you'll see uPortal demo there. And you can go ahead and run that. It's pretty easy. And there's the command at the bottom of the slide, Docker run dash IT dash P 8080 colon 8080. And that's to make sure it's still on the same port. Very you portal demo and just point your browser there and you're off and running. Um, if you don't use Docker, we have alternatives we'll discuss um, in just a few slides. But this is really exciting, kind of jumping on to, you know, modern approaches. Uh, Docker certainly being one of them to help facilitate quick turnaround and better interactions with your operations team or if you're in DevOps. Um, certainly a, a big step forward for us. Another thing is with the movement towards uh, different UIs and just more interesting front end technologies, uh, single page apps and whatnot, uh, we certainly want to start promoting our APIs. Uh, to this end, uh, we have some Swagger integration now. So if you bring up uPortal after you've made a small configuration change, the configuration change um, is documented in the uPortal repo under docs, developer, other, API. Um, and then you just set a flag to true and it'll generate the Swagger, Swagger pages for you. And then you can go ahead and go and dip into the API calls and see what the return values are to either create or enhance different front ends or just grab that information um, for other needs, even just frontlet, uh, portlet uh, in front using JavaScript. Um, in addition to those um, major enhancements, we also have several uh, smaller enhancements that are, are worth noting. Um, if you've run uPortal recently, you may have seen a bunch of JGroups issues or logging and it delays the build. So that's now been addressed in uPortal. Um, thanks to Drew. Uh, another thing is the foot nav um, region has been extracted and replaced by portlet now. So you can put your footer information in a portlet definition as opposed to having to modify um, this, the theming files. Uh, there was also some database cleanup, um, validation query class, and a, an issue with DB connection leaks in announcements. Thanks to Aaron over at Oakland for tracking those things down and pointing us in the right direction so that we can address those quickly. Uh, so definitely some improvements there. Along those lines, there's also been some improvements on the uPortal Start's CLI tools. So run Gradle W tasks to see all the new tasks that are coming out. Something related to that is also Java version check. We've had a, a couple of people who try to start up um, in uPortal 5 run into some issues because they were running um, Java 9 or Java 10. We currently don't support that in uPortal. Um, so it, it you know, 
caused some confusion. There's, there was some logging, but now uh, Gradle actually checks to make sure that you're using the right version of, of Java. Uh, and then as an alternative, if your institution doesn't support Docker, we've got two new tasks, Tomcat zip and Tomcat tar. What they'll do is uh, take the Tomcat uh, folder that's under .gradle and zip it up for you, ignoring the log files and some of the stuff that we don't need. And you can now take that zip file and then use that to distribute uh, uPortal with Tomcat and all configuration that's been captured in there to other servers. So it's a fallback for Docker. The improvements to the JVM config and memory are also in uPortal start. So uPortal start really captures everything you need for uPortal, including customizations to Tomcat and the JVM startup scripts. So this is really exciting. We, having to go back to 4.3 and jump back to 5, it really is a pleasure to get back uh, to, f to 5. Um, and it, it's sometimes painful to go back to 4.3 and having to manage Tomcat um, manually, where uPortal Start handles that so well um, in, in uPortal 5. Uh, and then there's been some documentation with everything moving so fast, it's hard to keep up on that documentation. So there's been some efforts uh, under sustained engineering to, to clean up documentation where it's really necessary, such as um, making or showing how to set up your database drivers and get that configured for anything other than hypersonic SQL that's built in. And then other little fixes like city links and weather portlet and mixed content in there. So those are kind of the highlights. There is plenty of other things that happen, but um, yeah, these, these are all adding up to be huge improvements for uPortal 5, and we're really excited about it. I'll hand it over to Drew to talk about uPortal 5.1. Yeah, hey, uh, this is Drew again. Uh, uPortal 5.1, it's a thing. Uh, we are on the precipice. Uh, we're very close to releasing uh, the next minor version of uPortal, uh, version 5.1. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I spent the last two or three weeks, I think, dodging Christian on this issue, but I intend to, to have it cut uh, quite soon um, this week, if possible, uh, certainly before the conference. It does not have uh, a, a massive amount of new features or changes the way that 5.0 did. It's not a new uh, major release. It, it's a new minor, and we should sort of fall into the rhythm of having a couple, three, uh, you know, maybe even four of these a year, if we can. Uh, the process of moving from 5.0 to 5.1 uh, should be extremely easy and streamlined. Uh, the version of uPortal that, that uPortal Start uses is controlled by a property. Uh, sometimes moving a, a minor version like this, uh, there will be you know, a little bit of data or configuration that you will potentially want to and perhaps even need to, but probably want to, uh, update in your uPortal start when you shift uh, minor versions like this. You should look uh, into the release notes uh, for that purpose to see you know, what there is to know uh, about moving to the next minor version when it's available. Uh, as it stands, the uh, uPortal 5.1 contains the four new items that you see on this list. Uh, in addition to all the fixes, uh, you know, bug fixes, um, you know, performance improvements, documentation enhancements, so forth, uh, that have already been added to uh, uPortal 5.0, the different 5.0 versions, all of that is also in uPortal 5.1. This list is only the things in uPortal 5.1 that are not also in 5.0. Uh, the list is not terribly long, uh, and you know already about most of them. Uh, we've already talked to you uh, on this presentation about API documentation and Swagger, uh, and uh, I think we had a brief mention of the uh, change to the sitemap portlet as well. Uh, last time we did one of these briefings, we talked uh, extensively about the CSS 
flex box uh, options for layouts. Those are only in ePortal 5.1. Uh, and then a uh, recent addition, there's a new REST endpoint for REST endpoint, sorry, for user info. Uh, it produces a, a, a JSON web token that you can use when you build, when you develop content for uPortal, uh, new kinds of content for uPortal. You can use this JWT to access uh, uh, REST you know, other REST endpoints that are a part of your new content that provide data to your new content, and you can identify uh, a portal user using this JWT. And you're going to see, a, a, you know, an example of what you might uh, do with that shortly. Uh, so we're just wrapping up a, um, you know, the folks from Oakland, I think Aaron's, yeah, Aaron's on the uh, thing. Folks from Oakland are where we are wrapping up, um, kind of troubleshooting a, a modest issue uh, with the socket technology, and we're trying to get that, uh, you know, settled down and merged before cutting a 5.1, but that is the, as far as I'm aware, the only thing we're waiting on. Uh, so late this week, uh, you know, sometime next week, at the earliest the following week, I'd say, uh, we will we will see a, uh, a U Portal 5.1. Uh, all right, uh, next slide. And at this point, handing off to Christian uh, and everyone, you know, wake up. I hope you have coffee because this is um, this is kind of a big deal. And there's going to be a lot of information on this at the uh, conference as well. Uh, please get your questions ready. Uh, it would be fantastic to spend, um, you know. 10 minutes or so at the end of this call, uh, you know, covering questions, doing Q&A, mostly focused around this topic. Anyway, take it away. Thanks, Drew. Howdy, folks. Um, so up next, we're going to be talking about kind of some of the new approaches to being able to add content into uPortal. And um, the best way to kind of introduce it is to show one of the new components that we've added in that uses this paradigm. Um, this is the new notification dropdown, which was built in partnership with Cal Poly Pomona. Um, kind of the story behind this is um, during their user research, they discovered that users wanted to be able to um, get information about um, upcoming um, events and upcoming um, assignments and so forth at kind of a heads up level without having to go to a new page and then go back. They just want to be able to glance at it, see what's new, um, see any priority items, and continue on the flow interrupted. Um, to accomplish this, we kind of um, borrowed a, uh, an idea that's widely used through a lot of social media, which is a um, notification dropdown that gives the heads up right there on the page without navigating off, um, with still keeping the ability at the very bottom to click on see all notifications, and get a full listing of the entire history of um, events and um, happenings going on. Um, so for this, this is the um, unstyled vanilla uPortal version. Um, this can be easily themed and customized for each university's needs. Um, one of the most exciting parts about this is in how it was built. And um, this is where a technology called Web Components comes in. Um, so Web Components is all about being able to take content from different sources, whether that's different sites or completely different portlets or soffits, and being able to integrate those on a page without them um, conflicting with styles, um, breaking each other's um, content, um, without the JavaScript somehow breaking each other. So the web component standard um, came into being to solve this very problem. And there are um, four parts to the web component standard and one part of the JavaScript standard, which we're going to talk about, which helps support this idea. Uh, the first one is custom elements. Um, custom elements is incredibly simple. You just um, have your piece of HTML that you want to display and you give it a custom name. For example, the, uh, 
The notification dropdown that we showed on the last page is called notification icon. So it's its own HTML element, notification dash icon. And that can be dropped on the page as many times as it needs to be. And it can have um, properties passed to it um, through HTML attributes, which lets these be configured. Um, another aspect of the standard is called Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM is all about, um, we want to be able to create interesting and engaging styles and themes for these components, um, but we don't always know the impact that it may have on some of the surrounding content. Um, so Shadow DOM specializes in creating a, a container around the styles for this component, like the notification icon, so that nothing from outside can impact the styles of that component, and nothing from inside it will impact things surrounding it on the page. Another aspect of the standard are um, HTML templates. Um, these are just little pieces of unrendered HTML that we can fill values into um, as needed. Um, it just creates a nice way that we can do templating without have to, having to try to um, write HTML kind of mixed into strings or some other hackery. Um, you just have the HTML, drop values into the right places, and it renders beautifully. Um, there's a semi-standard part of the um, specification as well called HTML imports. Um, that lets a HTML tag import basically another document or another part of the page. Um, but it's not supported by all browsers, and we haven't been leveraging that one as much. Um, instead, we've been leveraging a feature of the JavaScript standard itself, um, which is JavaScript modules. So we can actually import a specific um, JavaScript file, and it will, similar to the HTML component, contain that JavaScript in its own little bundle um, that won't impact other parts of the page. Um, so to put all of this together, we've been evolving the build system. Um, we now have two parts to it. The part that actually builds these new components is Node.js, which is a JavaScript um, runtime that can run on a server, um, and it can build JavaScript files down to compact bundles that we can easily add into a page. Um, but we still want to keep comfortable uh, things comfortable for folks. So we integrate the JavaScript build into Gradle. Um, so you can still run your standard Gradle build, and it will automatically pull down Node.js, um, run the appropriate scripts, and build out the expected output file in the notification war, for example, without needing to do additional setup steps. Um, for the, some of these initial components, we've been leveraging React. Um, and to help make that process simple, we've been leveraging a system that comes with, paired with React um, called Create React App. Um, it takes care of a lot of the bundling and building, optimizing all of the files so that we will always have a efficient and easy to add to the page component. And then we're also leveraging another technology called Reactive Elements, which binds React to the web component standard, which we talked about on the last slide. And then to make styling and integration easier, we're leveraging React Font Awesome, which adds icons onto the page and makes it really easy to add just the parts of the icons that you want. And React Strap, which wraps um, Bootstrap with some nice accessibility um, tidbits added to it um, into React so that we can build these components um, accessible, easy to use without having to add a bunch of um, additional ARIA attributes after the fact. And last but not least, we're leveraging React i18 Next, which is an internationalization library, which lets us pull in um, whatever language a user is using. We can translate each of these components into that language and display it appropriately. Um, some really exciting parts about this new paradigm is there is zero JSR 286 Portlick technology, and these components are 100% static HTML and JavaScript. And we're able to leverage the existing um, REST APIs within uPortal. Um, in addition, we're able to leverage the brand new um, user attribute system, which Drew um, integrated in. 
which lets us um, authorize these components with uPortal in a very standardized OpenID Connect um, way and grab any attributes or user information that we need from the portal um, and then communicate back and forth with the REST APIs in a completely um, secure manner. Putting this all together and kind of giving a demo of how this will look within a portal, um, this is how the notification portlet is actually being rendered today, the, uh, the notification icon that is. We have just a single custom element, the notification icon HTML, and underneath it, it's importing the JavaScript file that has everything bundled together, and that's it. Um, it renders on the page, and it takes care of all of the authentication, um, communicating with the REST APIs, all within that static HTML and JavaScript. Um, so it's a pretty exciting way moving forward with uPortal that we can build um, applications that will be more engaging and can render even offline at times um, and use very modern techniques that many um, front-end developers will be familiar with. Um, so we're pretty excited about this and we hope to get some more community discussion ongoing with that. Um, do folks have any questions about web components or about anything else we have chatted about during the presentation? Um, go ahead and pop those questions into chat and we can answer them as they come in. I know we can count on, on someone asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, uh, that's a good point, Peter. Uh, the footer was the, the footer uh, sitemap was converted to a portlet, uh, and now the only only thing on the page that is not a portlet is the navigation menu, and it may be difficult to convert that. It's very complicated. It may be very sort of difficult to convert that to a portlet. Not impossible, uh, but what we might do instead is just provide a, a configuration option to turn off the tabs and use uh, different uh, navigation strategies besides those uh, traditional tabs, different navigation strategies that are portlets or web components. <laughs> and Aaron Thanks, says, Matt. I like web components. Um, thanks, Aaron. We're pretty excited. We've heard a lot of positive feedback on web components. We're uh, hoping to see more adoption both within uPortal and within the community of that technology. Uh, the first one, so from question from Christian, was it difficult to do uh, this paradigm shift? Uh, the first one really kind of was difficult. Uh, we spent really, I would say, about double the time that I would hope we could do this kind of widget uh, doing it the first time because we had to solve a lot of problems. We had to uh, get uh, Gradle and you know, node talking together, you know, to build and package components. Uh, we had to deal with, you know, we had to take a good look at how we identify use, portal users, you know, to a, a REST API that is not portlet based. And we wanted to, wanted to solve all these things in a general way so they could be easily, you know, used again the next time. Uh, Peter, yes, it absolutely is. That, the, that widget, that web component, has already uh, been merged to the notification portlet. There's not a release yet. Uh, it's in master. There should be a release. We are just we're working with Cal Poly and you know with ourselves with whomever uh, just to kind of harden it. You know just to finish kind of testing it and kicking the tires before we do a. A release, but it's available right now for um, you know you you can update your project, you can build a 400 snapshot of notification, and run it in your local portal or any portal you like, and you can see it. Uh, when we cut a release, it will be bundled with uPortal Start right away. And by the way, there are more of these things coming. I don't think we mentioned that, but the uh, the Cal Poly Waffle menu is coming as a web component. 
and the browse carousels at the at the bottom of the page on the Cal Poly uh, experience are um, are coming as a web component as well. I can't, you know, I'm not too sure exactly when, but we have some, because we have some you know other things on the schedule. We're mixing it all, mixing it in together. But uh, both of those are works in progress. So where is the line? So the the concept is so a soffit is uh, a way, a soffit is a piece of content uh, that goes, you know, for uPortal, a piece of custom content for uPortal uh, that is not JSR 286 portlet based, uh, which is great. Uh, we can get away from that. We can easily produce soffits that are spring boot projects and, uh, you know, don't have dependencies on, on the portlet API and, you know, and we can develop them without learning about crazy things like action requests and resource requests and things that don't exist elsewhere in web development. Uh, that part is great about soffits, but the original, uh, the original approach to soffits that was made available in uPortal 5.0 is still, is still a strategy, it, it, it nevertheless is still a strategy for producing um, DOM elements based on server-side rendering. I mean, it's, it's a better form of server-side rendering, uh, you know, well, better in some ways, it's attractive. Uh, attractive to me, uh, but it is still server-side rendering, and more and more we are just get getting feedback from the community, uh, particularly from members of the community or elements within the community who are most interested in developing new stuff. Uh, we're getting feedback that you know that we are no longer uh, interested in server-side rendering, just full stop. Uh, so the web components take takes care of that. And from Peter, how do we see the Swagger documentation in the uPortal API? Uh, there's uh, there's a property that you have to turn on in uh, typically in uPortal.properties. It's in the documentation, the uPortal 5 manual. There's a property that you have to add to your, your uPortal.properties, and the value has to be true. Uh, and then when you start Tomcat, you can go to a specific uh, URL. Does anyone remember it offhand? It's like swagger underscore UI dot HTML or something. Uh, it's also in the documentation. Uh, and the reason that we need this property is that we probably don't want the Swagger documentation published to a, a production uh, uPortal system. It's, it's a security consideration because it provides, you know, too much documentation and insight into how the portal works. Uh, so you have to turn it on with a property. Christian's got the, uh, you know, the manual page. And Christian C can give you that manual page in French. And Tobin wants to go back to being a student. Yeah, uh, so, you know, as we add new things to uh, uPortal 5051, five, 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 uh, we are being particularly careful, especially with new things, uh, to give, to represent them in the manual, in the documentation. I really I want to encourage uh, all of you in no uncertain terms to look uh, at the notification um, you know web component notification icon web component uh, that was recently done and follow the work around the waffle menu and the the browse carousel. Uh, the uh, you know I will warn you it is kind of this move this shift kind of reminds me of the shift from subversion to get. The reasons uh, for doing so, to me, they're undeniable. We stand to gain a lot more by uh, making this move, uh, you know, moving away from JSR 286 portlets than we stand to lose. Uh, you know, most of you are aware that Spring 5, Spring version 5, the next major version that we're not on yet, 
Uh, Spring 5 drops support for Portlet MVC, and our Portlets are, you know, in the community are primarily bi uh, built on Spring Portlet MVC. But it's not just that. It, it, it's not just a matter of Spring. The at Unicon, in the community, and in the higher ed community, I run into a lot of talented folks uh, who are sort of front-end minded, talented designers and UI engineers uh, that I would love to get working on content for you portal. You know, it's, it's a whole class of people that I would like to persuade to work on uh, content components for you portal. But you know, when you talk to them about what it looks like to build content for uPortal, if you talk about JSR 286 portlets, you lose them. Uh, so we need a new story. We've worked hard for, you know, months. This, this odyssey, this, you know, new paradigm and opportunity is uh, a long time in the works. It's not out of the blue. And, and we've worked, uh, you know, for several quarters uh, you know, in the community, in oral tradition, and on the list, and, and elsewhere, we've worked to develop a new story uh, for content development. Uh, and this is important. Uh, this sets us up, this move helps to set us up for the future. Uh, it is, you know, for those of you who don't do node development, and that's me, uh, not yet, it is, you know, it's something new and it's slightly complicated, uh, but I'm, you know, gladly willing to do it because it, um, you know, we need to set our, ourselves up for a future. So Peter, that's a great, um, that's a great point. And I would love to see it too, if you're volunteering, uh, a new, you know, well thought out wiki article. Uh, but but I want to nuance that. I want to add to that. I kind of think that the so, you know so soffit is a word that uh, you portal. Uh, oh, welcome, Tim. You're just in time. Uh, soffit is a, a a word that the you portal you know platform adopted and added meaning to. Uh, you know said you know soffit is the word we're going to use to describe this thing. Uh, you know, we're the ones who who added meaning to that term in this context in the first place. Uh, so I think we have the opportunity to evolve that term soffit in the direction of these web components. To me, these are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think they do. Um, it's the... So we have some uh, uPortal technology uh, that helps you consume the user info token from uPortal to establish a user's identity. We have some technology that you can use, that you can take from uPortal and put into your module that has web components. Uh, that, that technology is in uh, the soffit jar together with the other soffit technology in a package that includes the word soffit. <laughs> All right, that sounds sensible. Uh, so uh, Andrew, Andrew Petro wanted to call this technology cephalopod originally, you know, as in an octopus or a squid. Soffit, it's, uh, the sort of definition that was relied on for choosing that word uh, was the the base of a uh, an arch, or pretend, potentially the base of a uh, a portal or a gateway. Providing a link, I hope it's a decent one. All right. Uh, I I have nothing else. I think it went, you know, we got through things decently. Uh, last last call for questions, folks. Uh, excellent. Yeah, the presentation will be available online on YouTube, as you're aware.
Uh, I understand, you know, I know that particularly towards the end, we got a little deep uh, into a technical uh, topic. Thanks for your patience. Uh, the, you know, this web component stuff and the new um, ideas, not the first new ideas, but some new ideas around content for the portal, they're, they're really exciting and important. So, uh, you know, thanks for um, staying awake. All right. All right. I will stop the recording and end the meeting then. Thank you, everybody.